Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday afternoon uh, stream, which is like slightly different from the normal um, Friday lecture because tomorrow is a public holiday. But um, today we've got the the same lecture that we would have had on the Friday, but uh, instead um, we're just doing it this afternoon on Thursday. So. Just making sure microphone's working and everything. Yeah, looks like everything's okay. I hope everyone's having a good Thursday so far. I hope everyone's made... Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot this slide here. This is not actually my normal starting slide, but I hope everyone's... Um, um, everyone's already working on the, um, the midterm exam, which was released earlier today, because it's due tonight. I mean, there's plenty of time to do it. It's like the same amount of workload as the, the first assignment, so it shouldn't be too hard to get that all finished. Uh, by midnight tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize if anyone just had a heart attack. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. It was April 1st. <laughs> Sorry, it's pretty funny. I'm seeing the comments now. People, are, people have realized. Um, so, uh... <laughs> Let me just... <laughs> I know I know it's after midday uh, on April 1st, but, you know, there was no lecture before midday, and it is April 1st, so I thought it'd be funny. And <laughs> it's like people talking about uh, having heart attacks and stuff like that. So let me, um, let me just <laughs> move on to the next slide before everyone keels over. Um, I'll move my face out of the way, so <laughs> here you go. <laughs> All right, don't worry, it's April Fool's. There's no midterm exam. I mean, even if there was, they would have to have been like, I would have to tell you about this, like, way, way in advance. Like, you would have known about this at the start of term. But, you know, fun anyway. <laughs> Everyone's like, unsubscribe, video dislike. But look, look how cute, look how cute this is. This is like a series of photos of chicken being very, very friendly and rolling around and accepting pats. So there, there you have it. Um, <laughs> people are talking about sweating profusely. Someone said they were coughing up blood. <laughs> Someone's like, not funny, didn't laugh. Uh, okay. <laughs> Now that you've all thoroughly entertained me, and I hope maybe I've entertained you a little bit, <laughs> let's move on <laughs> to the actual content. So I I went to the trouble of, of making a custom slide deck for this, so I made this uh, specific <laughs> April 1st. <laughs> just two slides here, just to get everyone. Alright, <laughs> let's go back. <laughs> To the actual slides for today. <laughs> so, um, hopefully everyone's been enjoying the uh, April 1st stuff that's been going around. I noticed that uh, Google Maps did a 8-bit um, Nintendo Entertainment System version of, of Google Maps. Um, and uh, CSC Sock has decided to start their own cryptocurrency, which is called the Mark Coin. So it's actually my face on it, which, which I found quite hilarious. So yes, uh, a little bit of lightheartedness for an April 1st. Um, I think this is actually the first time in, this is the third year that we've hit an April 1st with um, COM 1511, where there's actually been a lecture on April 1st. So you're actually the first cohort of students to, to receive an April 1st gag from COM 1511. Okay, so let's move on to what we're actually doing today. So a bit of a recap. Uh, yesterday, uh, usually there would have been more time in between these, so you have more time to like kind of soak it in. Um, but so this will probably be fresh in your memory, but maybe not fully confirmed in your memory yet. Uh, but uh, yesterday we looked at memory. So we were looking, and I think the key thing we looked at yesterday was memory allocation. So we were getting memory that was going to last longer than the... Um, uh, longer than the function that it actually exists in. And up until that point, pretty much every variable that we'd created, I mean, I guess you could think about the constants are different. 
So the constants are something else, but every variable we created up until that point was something that existed within the set of curly brackets and would not exist outside of the curly brackets it was created in. Um, but we did think that there were potentially times where we would might, might want to use something outside of its own curly brackets, pass memory around and things like that. And with memory allocation, we can do that. Um, so this links up with what we know about pointers. Um, it's a little bit connected to what we've learned about arrays as well. And then we started building up custom variables. Now these two topics go very much hand in hand uh, because most of the time that we're going to be using um, uh, memory allocation, we'll be allocating chunks of memory for possibly larger variables a lot of the time, and structs give us that capability. So structs give us the capability of making custom variables out of other variables and chunks of other variables. So um, structs are sometimes declared like normal variables inside the curly brackets, but are very, very often declared using memory allocation. So um, if you remember ages ago, I talked about the heap, which is a big chunk of memory that a program can use. Um, and it's kind of like, it's like open memory. So it's not really assigned to anything particular. There's other parts of our memory that the program uses, which is just like where the instructions of the program are, where the pre-declared variables are. So all the variables that are declared in your code. Um, there's another section, which is called the stack, which I will talk about later, actually, because we are going to get to that eventually. Um, which is the current state of the program and thinking about how a program tracks where it is. So it's not even just a line number. Sometimes it's all a whole bunch of other information, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and um, structs, if they're allocated in this heap area, this open memory area, um, are allowed to just kind of exist on our commands. Um, and then we'll also remove them on our commands as well. So we looked at memory allocation and freeing Today, we are expanding our knowledge a little bit further on a couple of other things. Um, the first thing is um, using multiple files for one project. And this is quite interesting because a lot of the programs we've been making have, have kind of had this implication in them already. So we've already started, in a sense, separating the sections of our code files into the stuff that gets declared before the main. Right, and so that's like function declarations. Now we have struct declarations, hash includes, and other stuff like that. Um, all of that could be considered the pre program section. That's not even a technical term. I just made that up then on the spot. So it's the section that goes before the main. And then you've got the main and then the other functions. And so the main is like this is the bit that literally runs. You know, the program starts on the first line of the main and it runs through these definitely. Below that, we've got all the functions. And all of those functions are um, other pieces of information that the main can jump to and from, you know. So some functions that are in a program don't even run. You know, sometimes we could write a program, we've got some functions in it, and then later on we're like, oh, we don't need those functions. But we'll leave them there because we might use them for something else later in development, but there'll be times we run the program and the functions don't even run. So they're not even considered sort of part of the main program itself. Um, they're, they're considered, you know, useful extra bits that we can use. And we're going to talk about spreading this all up, up into different files so that we can then... Um, organize things by what their capabilities are in a sense and it also like to on a, on a side note helps us out a little bit with protection of certain amounts of data we're going to go into this in more detail later in the course uh, but i'm going to introduce it to you today anyway um, the second assignment is going to be a multi-file project. That's going to be coming out next week. That one's not an April Fool's joke. That one has been planned for quite some time. Um, but it'll be coming out next week, and it's got roughly three weeks worth of work in it, similarly to the first assignment. So the structure is going to be something that I think is reasonably familiar to you now. We're also starting, as I said yesterday, this kind of uh, new dramatic arc <laughs> in the... Um, <laughs> Jenny says, no, you can say the second assignment is a joke now. <laughs> oh, I'll go to the next slide. Don't worry. Everything's a joke. Uh, unfortunately, there are actually, well, not unfortunately. <laughs> There's a lot of things that people want to learn, right? There's a lot of things that people want to, uh, want to hear about and want to learn about programming. So I'm still going to teach you how to be a good programmer. So I was talking um, yesterday about this kind of dramatic arc that was going to go over multiple episodes. Um, that's where we are at now. So we're in the first of, I think, three lectures worth that are going to delve 
into this thing called linked lists. And linked lists are really interesting because they're going to combine a whole lot of the kind of advanced programming concepts that we've looked at in 1511. I mean, they're still going to use some of the simple things, but they're going to use some of the more advanced things a lot. And a lot of what we've talked about, uh, pointers and structs and memory allocation, uh, are kind of necessary for these things to work. And linked lists lead us to this this wonderful kind of theoretical concept of uh, nodes and um, uh, nodes and connections between nodes and nodes of information. So I'll explain that later, what I mean by the word node. Um, but we'll get into that in the second half of the lecture today. And we might start the demo. We'll see how much time we have. We're probably going to get it started, but we're not going to get too deep in it today. And then we're going to go more and more into it as we, um, uh, as we learn more about linked lists over the next week. <laughs> someone said someone's already disliked the stream. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's based on, on how I started the stream. Um, I'll take that dislike. I, I understand. I, I caused, I caused some heart palpitations there at the beginning. So, um, it was worth it. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at these multiple file projects. Um, a lot of the time we're going to separate things into multiple files so that the code is separated kind of by subject in a sense. So, so we've got one file that does all the work for a particular thing. We've got another file that does all the work for another thing. So you could consider that if we looked at our first assignment, we could have had um, map related status and map related functions go in one um, in one file and like player related uh, functions and or just like game engine like you know how does this thing go from sequence one to, to the next step in time and that kind of thing in another file we could actually have, have put these in different files and the way we're going to connect them together is the hash include keyword so up until this point I've said a lot about um, pieces of code that we had been thinking about like hash include and we talked about libraries and stuff but I hadn't given you the full um, the full rundown of what hash include can do because there's one version of hash include that we've got a lot of experience with even if we don't have a full understanding of it is hash include standard input output you know so we do the angle brackets standard input output and we know that it gives us access to something else um, most of us probably haven't even looked at, at what that is and you don't really have to you just trust that someone else has made some functions and you can look up the documentation for them and you can use them the trick now is we don't just have to hash include things that you know the C standard library has built for us to use. We can actually write our own files and hash include those files. So now instead of hash including something that you 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 trust and you definitely know that a whole bunch of experienced C programmers can work on, you can now hash include things that might not work because they're your own code. <laughs> it's a good and bad thing, right? Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It gives you the ability to separate your code so you can be like, not everything's in this one giant file where I can't find anything. I can organize things by subject. So it's kind of like we, was, we started to organize things by their functionality in functions. Um, but now we're looking at, we, we can do that with, um, with the entire file and its own series of functions and its own structs and data and things like that can be separated out and be like, you don't need to look at this necessarily but there's a lot of information in there that does these specific purposes. So we can start to treat our own files the way we treat libraries. So we've worked on our own library in the past and we go, okay, this is cool. Uh, now we can hash include it in multiple other projects and use them. The same way that someone made the standard input output library um, and you've been able to hashing like over this course, just in the last, um, last sort of five, no, we're at seven weeks now. So it's not six, cause we didn't really do much work in the six week. Although I'm sure people were working on assignments then. But anyway, in that time we've hash included the standard input output library several thousand times. You know, I would, I would hazard a guess. We're probably at like, you know, five, 5,000, uh, maybe a bit much, but potentially 5,000 includes of, um, of, of the C standard of, of the, the standard input output library. So we've used it in so many, many different programs. Um, and that's one of the benefits of um, using hash include and in multiple file projects is you can have a library that's useful for certain things and you'll never have to rewrite bits of it. So imagine if the standard input output library was a series of things you had to keep re-implementing. Every one of your programs up to this point would have to implement the same thing at the beginning. So that's the nice thing about having those libraries and also being able to make our own. 
So we could make something that we think we're going to use in multiple places, um, and then we can have just this 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 code file that we can say, all right, we're going to include this whenever we need it. Um, Oh, uh, Walid was also saying, did we finish up freeing memory last lecture? Uh, we didn't actually finish freeing up the memory last lecture, but um, I do have, um, after the end of the lecture, I did some stuff for freeing. So it is recorded there in video. Um, you can look at it there, uh, but you don't necessarily have to because in the examples that we're going to keep working on, we're going to talk more about um, uh, freeing memory and also the code we're going to use to free memory. So there is some code there uh, left over from yesterday, uh, but we'll be we'll be doing more of it anyway. Um, okay, so I oh, just people saying this. Yeah, there's not that many people here today, but that's fine. There there are clashes. Um, so this is like an off schedule lecture. It just has to happen today because tomorrow's a public holiday and I will not actually be here tomorrow. So I'm considering that this lecture is kind of, it's basically a recorded lecture um, that happens to also be live streamed. So it's a recorded lecture that people can watch at their leisure. But um, I figured if I was going to record a two hour lecture, I might as well do it as a stream. And I picked a time that has a minimal clash with other subjects and things. So clash with our own subject as well. Um, but it doesn't have a uh, it doesn't have a completely zero clash. I would have to do that late at night if I wanted to do that, and then I think that we'd have less people coming. Okay, so we talked about the idea of why we might do multiple file projects and some of how we connect it together. So let's talk about the different files that we're going to be using for this. So C up until this point, you've been working with. Um, the C files. So every file that you've written has had .c on the end. So whatever the file name is, .c. Um, I'm now introducing a new file, which shouldn't be that unfamiliar because you've actually seen some of these. You haven't really looked at the files themselves, but you've seen that they exist, which are .h files. And .h files are known as header files, whereas the C file is often called the implementation file. And so these are going to be separated based on the purposes that they serve. Um, and they're going to be separated similarly to how we would separate our code. Let me just show you a previous code file that we've been working on. Um, let's look at yesterday's because yesterday's has um, some interesting stuff to look at. All right. So what we could do is we could consider this part of my code file to be a header in terms of it being um, the stuff that we need to do to prepare for the rest of the code to be able to work. So in this, I've got stuff like hash defines. I have some hash includes that I might need. Um, I've declared some structures that I'm going to use and like all through the code is going to use those structures. And I've said what my functions are. So we, um, we get from this a picture of what the capabilities are. Of, of this code file, but we don't actually get anything that runs. So we don't get anything where we can understand um, exactly what these functions are doing. All we get is a thing saying these functions exist. I mean, we can take a little bit from their names, depending on how well we wrote their names, what they're going to do. So this is actually what we would think of as the header to the program. And then we've got the main, and the main's pretty clear, because the main's the first thing I taught you, in a sense, about programs. The main is the line by line instructions that we're going to run. So this is the recipe we're following to make this thing work. And then down here, we have the functions that we might be using. So this is the one that I did after the lecture last time. If you want to go back, you can watch after the two hour mark. Um, and actually, it wasn't, it wasn't that detailed. I actually just copy pasted a bunch of this from the lecture slides while I was talking about it. We're going to cover this stuff again later, so don't worry too much about it. Um, but these are the functions that assist the main in doing what it's doing. So these are kind of like, like another reference for the capability of the program 
in a sense. Um, so we could nearly, if we wanted to, separate the program into those three parts like that. And so I'm going to show you a, a kind of a, a formal way in which we're going to do that. And this is a very, very common way that we're going to be doing this um, when we're doing C programming. So we've got um, the header files and the C files, and the header files are that kind of uh, the top part of the code that says what it's kind of capable of um, and how you could use it without necessarily understanding line by line all the code that's in it. Whereas the C file, the implementation file, is where we're going to store the things that do the actual running code for the things that are in the H file. So, a bit more detail what's going on. I actually have a full example on this that I'm going to show you, but I want to um, talk a little bit about the idea of these things first, and then we'll look at the concrete examples. So a header file just shows you what the functions are in the code, but not how they work. So we're not getting the full definition of the function, we're just getting the declarations of the functions. And as I talk more about this, you're going to start to understand how um, how we were putting together our C files. Because we talked about, you know, we put all the function declarations at the top, and then we did the main, we put all the function definitions at the bottom. So so we had like the, the prototypes as, a, as another word for it at the top of like, just telling people that the function exists without actually giving them any information on how it works. Um, so we had that kind of thing, and then at the bottom we had the actual working bits of it. We're going to actually be separating, separating these out into multiple files. So we get what people know to use our code, and then we have this new thing, which someone was actually asking me about yesterday, um, which is called type def, which is short for type define. And it's interesting because it's something that allows us to give a... To, to kind of invent a type in C. Um, but it's interesting because all it does is it basically says that anytime you see this word, what it means is this other word. So the most common way we're going to do this is we're going to have a struct and the struct is going to be built up of multiple bits and pieces, um, but we're going to call it something else. So instead of calling it, um, what were we calling uh, struct bender yesterday? Um, we could just call it bender by using a type defined to say, no, this word actually means this word. Sounds simple at the beginning because it's just, it's just a word replacement with another. But when you get deeper into it, it actually has some deeper ramifications about how it actually protects us from accessing data the wrong way. I'll talk, you, I'll talk to you more about that when, it, when we get to it, yeah. So it actually keeps our data safe. Um, the other things that happen in the H file, we get our function declarations, as I was saying before, but without any definitions. And what we usually get in the H file is we use it as nearly a, a documentation file. So we'll be putting all of our comments about things in there. So all of our explanations of how things work and why they work and stuff are going to be in the header file. So it's nearly like we concentrate on the header file being the user readable file so the human readable file that says okay these are all the things you can do these are the capabilities they will give you here's a nicer name for the struct so you don't have to use the struct name and all this kind of stuff so it's nearly like this is the forward-facing presentation of things um, that make it easy for a human to then use my code while my actual running code is hidden away in another file so that people don't even have to look at it to be able to use it uh, so that's what the header file, that's the purpose the header file is going to have. Yeah, and usually there isn't a single line of code that would actually execute in the H file. So it's entirely um, a, a structural file, a file that shows you what you can and can't do, explains it and things like that. And in most cases, you can use uh, functions and um, data structures and things that are delivered to you in the H file without ever even opening or looking at the C file. As long as the H file has been written well enough and has its documentation, that's all you need. So conversely, what we're going to have in the C file, I'm going to show you all of this as well. <laughs> hey, Mish was like, safe from what? This is a good question. I will, I will cover that later. There are ways in which we can access the information in a struct in a way that is incorrect. But I'll talk to you more about that as we go. Um, I, have, I have demos and examples on that kind of thing. So the C file is, is the mirror image of the H file. The C file will actually have all of the same functions 
that the h file has, but instead of having just the definition, sorry, just the declaration of the function, just the thing, the one liner that says what's, what its inputs and outputs are, it'll have all the running code for each function. So it'll say each of these functions was created for a purpose. Um, and now this is the actual purpose being fulfilled. So line by line in this code, this is how it actually runs. So if we've had a type def as well, and very often when we're doing the C and H file combo, this, this kind of multi-file project combo, um, we are going to have this type def struct combo. So in the H file and from the, the human readable side of it, they just see a, a nice name for a data structure. But in the C file, we see the actual bits and pieces of the struct itself. So it's like, oh, it's got these integers in it that mean these things. It's got these strings in it that mean these things. Um, it's got a big array of other structs that mean other things, you know, um, that kind of thing in there. But um, in the H file, all you will see is like, there is a struct that represents something, but we're not really going to be calling it a struct. And all we have to access this thing is a series of functions. Um, I shouldn't talk too much about this. I'm going to go quickly over this and start showing you the actual files though, because I think it's better to actually see an example and I can show you why things are the way they are. But what I'm trying to say is the H file is the, it's not actually H because it's human readable. It's H because it's a header, but you can think of it as that. It's the human readable side of things that allows you to read that and be able to use it in another program. And then the C file is the, the nuts and bolts that actually makes it work. I think I used this example before um, when I was talking about this of um, when you're driving a car, on the inside of the car you can see the steering wheel and you can see the pedals and you know that that kind of controls the car. It goes left and right um, and it speeds up or it slows down based on what you do with the pedals. You don't know necessarily how the engine's working. I mean, some of you do. I'm sure there's some people who, who know a lot about car engine stuff, but you don't have to. Um, so the C file is the engine doing all its work and the brakes and all this kind of stuff. And the H file is you just seeing that you can move the things and make it happen. So in a way, it's a way of separating the complexity out from our code. So there's one vision of the code that it's easy to understand and easy to use. And then there's another view of the code, which is highly detailed and has all the complexity, but makes the thing actually work. So that's the difference. Um, there are other files as well. Um, we will generally have a file called main.c um, and that's because whenever we're looking at a program, we usually want to know how it works. And so we want to find the actual main function and say, okay, how does this thing start and how does it do its running line by line? So what we will often do is every C program's got to have one main. Um, I would say one specifically. You can't have more than one and it can't have... I was about to say, it, some things can have less than one, but they're not really C programs. They don't really run. Those are just libraries. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick to that. Every program in C has one main function. So it's an entry point so that our computer knows where it starts reading lines of code and running them. So what we will often do when we've got a multi-file project and we've got lots of different files is one of our files is called main.c. And that way we'll be able to find where the main function is and know uh, where things are coming from, where they're starting. So. Um, the main.c is going to run code and if it needs other code to run, if it needs other capabilities, it will hash include those files. So the main file will most all the time include um, the h file that says this is the stuff I need. And this is the same as having the, um, the declarations and the hash defined and the structs and stuff like so up here. So you can see that these H files are included up here. Each of these H files has a bunch of stuff that looks like this. It's not exactly the same, obviously, but they have their own hash defines. They have their own functions and they may have structs and things like that that we can use. So each one of these is basically copy pasting on this line, a bunch of stuff like this. And so if we want to do the same thing, we could take all of this and move it out into another file and say, this is our header file for this particular program. Um, questions? All right, Tom's answering those questions. Yeah, so I think Hussein's question there about whether main.c is like a requirement. Does it have to be named that way for C to be able to understand it? No, not necessarily. Um, but we do it 
so that we as humans can find it more easily. Okay, so I actually mentioned here the example, so I have an example today. Uh, it's on the website as well as in the live code section of the website. So we're gonna have a look at that in a second. Yeah, just one more slide. We're gonna talk about compiling this. So it's really, really interesting when we're compiling um, multiple file projects. So you note that every time we've compiled, say, this project here, all we've done is compiled the, the C file that the project is written in. Um, so this is a single file project, but it's still the same theory. Um, and then we've given it a name to compile with. So if I do that, this is going to compile. Well, I'm glad it is because I left it like this at the end yesterday. Um, this is the only code file that it's looking at. And that's interesting because there are these three code files as well. So these three files are part of my project, um, but I didn't have to say anything about them when I compiled. All I said was compile this C file. So reading this C file, my compiler is able to pick up these other ones and say, I'm going to use these. So we don't actually have to do anything weird like, so if I was doing a multiple file project and I thought I needed these files as well, it's not necessarily the case. The hash include does that work for us. So when we're making our own, where we've got multiple files, if we've included them, we don't actually need to compile them. So the H files in general won't need to be compiled, but the C files will, because the C files aren't necessarily done with hash includes. So the C files, when they're compiled, just create a whole series of bits of code that can run, and the H files tell us where to find them. So what we'll be doing is including uh, not include. Well, we we will be including all of the H files, and we will be compiling all of the C files. Um, so I think it's very much time to start looking at an example now, because I've covered it a little bit um, to to give you, I guess, a theoretical understanding of this. But I fully understand at this point, with me talking about things I haven't shown you yet, that you're going to be a bit like. I'm not really getting what's going on here. So I think we need a concrete example to show you what's happening. So let's look at multi-file project. <laughs> the project's called I'm Batman. This is, um, this is from two years ago, I think. There was, um, as I was doing demonstrations of things, I think the first time I did that team demonstration, I wasn't, it wasn't Avatar The Last Airbender because that hadn't come back out on Netflix yet, but I did it with the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> for fun. Um, and someone drew a bat symbol on the board behind me before the next lecture, so I just like started including this this Batman example and thing. So what we have, we're not going to implement this whole thing because we're not um don't really have time to build multiple projects uh, today. We're going to be going on to another one instead. But I have this one already built for you, and we're going to look at it and see how it works. So it has three files. It has a person.h, and this is a header file. And this shows how we can use this person idea. So what we have is um, some statistics for a person and it's based on a, a superhero kind of thing. So each person has um, their name and their superpowers and stuff. And then we have some functions that allow us to, to give someone superpowers. So the person.h gives us the interface that we call it to, to do that. So it tells us what functions we can use. It tells us how to name the type that is defined in um, in this person.c and person.h. So we would include the person.h in the main.c so that we could use these things. Person.c will just get compiled along with the main.c. <coughs> the person.c has all of the information about how these functions work if you wanted to delve deeper and see how they work. And the main.c has an example of how we're going to include and use these. So I think it's definitely time for us to have a look at this code. So, don't know if people remember when I do dot dot in the change directory, it goes up one level. So dot dot would take me back to public HTML so that I can go down to another lecture. This week's lecture is lecture 12. So we'll have a look at there. I've got a directory in there called multi-file which is the um, this set of three files I was talking about. So there's a main.c, 
a person.c and a person.h. Let's just open all of these. This is another trick. If I want to open all the files in a folder, I can I can say gedit and the star is all the files that match uh, this. And since this the, the star matches everything, so it's going to pick up all three of these files. I think I've done that before, right? Okay, so I've got my main.c, my person.c, and my person.h. So this I last edited this late last year, still reasonably current. So let's look at the person.h first. Um, there's a couple of questions there. I'm going to leave you with the questions, Tom, because I think you've got you've got time to answer them while I'm talking about other things. But yeah, there are some really good questions there, so they're worth answering. Um, things like uh, Josh is asking if you have more than one main. Uh, if you have more than one main, your compiler is going to complain because it's going to say, I don't know where the entry point is into this. So a lot of comments here on what I'm doing, so you can read this in detail if you want. I've got comments here saying what the header is used for. So we're going to look at this as a human and say, this is the thing we're going to use to, um, uh, to, to, to just basically work with this idea of a person in this particular program. So we have some hash defines here. Um, they're pretty short, but I think that we trusted that this was going to work. So we have a limit on the length of the person's name and the length of a power. So we've got like some superpowers that we're going to have some, probably some strings by the look of this. And this is how big they're going to be. And each person has a maximum of five powers. So I guess, I guess there's something there. This is an interesting line. This is something you wouldn't have seen before, which is why there's all these comments before it talking about it. You can go back over them and read this if you want. So, struct person pointer, this is one type. And then we have this capital P person, and this is a type that doesn't exist. We haven't created it, but note the capital. So, heaps of things that we've done before, we have this convention that they're lowercase letters. Now we're talking about this specific type that we've created now becomes an uppercase um, because it kind of becomes a type that we know that we can use but we can't necessarily go deeper in and access it. So we know that somewhere in my code there's going to be a struct person. We don't know in this code file because note this code file has no hash includes right? So it has no information from anywhere in the program or anything. This is coming from scratch with no other information. So because it has no other information, it definitely does not know what a struct person is, but it knows that whatever struct person is, we can make a pointer to it because we know that all pointers are a specific size. All memory addresses are a specific size, right? So struct person pointer, we're now going to call this a person instead. So instead of saying and implying that this struct exists, because in this code file it doesn't exist, what we're saying is we're going to use the concept of a capital P person instead. And so capital P person becomes a variable type that we can use. Under the hood, I'm using a lot of car analogies here, right? Under the hood, this is a struct person pointer. It's a memory address to a variable that has some stuff in it, but this file doesn't know anything about it. So it's just going to say concept of a person. Um, we're going to let you think of it as the concept of a person. And then the code itself is going to deal with this in other ways. So capital P person is used here. And so we have a person and we're going to name them in this as a hero. So we have the ability to create, we have the ability to free. These are things that we've done um, previously with structs, but now we're using, instead of struct person pointers, so this is the one type, and this is the name we're using for that type. Don't get confused by the fact that the asterisk is right next to this person. This is one type. And then this is a name that represents that type. Okay, so we, if we create a person and we've got creating a person with their name, we get back that person. So that's good. So if we've created them, we get the information about them. Um, if we're going to free them, we don't need any information back. And then we have two things, the ability to give a superpower to someone and the ability to display who they are. So the ability to give a superpower is going to do something in the back end. Uh, to, to make changes to whatever data structure this person happens to represent, which we don't know anything about, and we don't need to know anything about. 
All we need to know is that we can create them, we can give them superpowers, and we can display their information. Um, and when we're finished using them, we can free them. It's very interesting thinking that maybe superheroes are all trapped, and what we need to do is free them all. Anyway, let's <laughs> That was not necessary, that's not part of coding, I just got distracted. So, if we only have these four functions, then if we use this person.h in our main.c, then we know that that's all that we can do. Um, if we've included person.h, and check this out, we are no longer including with the um, angle brackets like that, if we've made the file and it's sitting in the same directory as this main.c when it's compiled, then we will use these double quotes. You can actually do things like going to other directories. So I could go dot dot, so to go up a directory and into a neighboring directory called lib, for example. This is actually the way that a lot of people do it. Um, this is a, a standard convention, convention to put your libraries in a separate folder called lib. So we often do that. Um, and we can do that with this double quotes. When we're using the angle brackets, we're not actually saying we know where it is. We're asking the compiler to find it in a sense. So these quotes say, we know exactly where this thing is. And if I just have the, the name of the file there, it means here in the same directory, look for the file. Okay, so if I've included person.h, and you note, you note that I have not opened person.c and I have not looked at it yet. So I'm using this without even knowing what the back end is. So, if I look at person.h, I see if I want to use it in my main, then I have been given all of this stuff as my header. So this is the same as um, in the previous file, how up here, before the main started, we had a whole bunch of stuff. We had hash defines, we had function definitions, we had hash includes for other things. And you note that we don't need any of them because we've kind of deferred all of that stuff to the h file here and the h file says these are all the functions you have available to do the things you need to do so coming back to my main.c here um just see if there's any questions oh someone's asking can we use h files in assignment 2 your assignment 2 will literally not work without h files <laughs> so when you get your assignment 2 which is next week um, you will see that we're not going to give you a single file for that. We're going to give you, um, I think it'll be like five files. It's not, it's not exact. I have, I have to look really closely at the implementation. It depends on how we're splitting up bits and pieces of it as well. But we're going to give you a chunk of files and you're going to have to work in this kind of layout, which honestly is, is actually like a more convenient layout because all the stuff is, is kept in their own files, and we don't really need to look at the C file yet, right? So our main.c says, there's a person, and I know that I can declare a person because I've been given this type definition that says capital P person is a type that you can use. And it'll make one of these, but I don't really know what that is, so I'm not going to worry about that. I just know that capital P person can be put into um, these functions, and I can receive them from these functions as well. So the first person I create is Batman. So I create person and I give them a name as I saw here, create person and I had an array and I'm just being really polite here and saying, look, if you're going to use this function, know that it is expecting this to exist, right? I could do this without a length in there. It wouldn't actually change what the function is, but sometimes I like to put these in there um, to help us understand the function. So I've called the create person function. I've put a name in and that gives me back a person. So exactly what I've done here call the create person function, put a name in, and it gives me back a person. So now I have a variable called Batman, um, and I can do things with Batman. So the first thing I can do is just display Batman. So this is um, this is my first look at who Batman is. Batman has not got any powers yet, because I have not given Batman any powers, but I can display them, and they will show probably just the name. And then I can use the give power function, because I know in here that the give power function exists and it takes a power and a hero and it's going to add that power to that person who's called hero here. So I've added some powers to Batman. So obviously there's there's the ninjutsu skills, 
tech gadgets, but there's ability to brood, which is probably more important than either of those previous things. And then the most important thing is the gravelly Christian Bale voice um, that, that he uses to intimidate people, which is arguably his biggest power. So, um, Jeffrey was asking about different ideas about defining the type def struct person and whether you need the the star on the person or not um you're right it, oh actually tom said give it a go so um, i'm gonna let you give it a go rather than giving you the answer um so yes um someone also said isn't batman's power just being rich and yeah i probably could have replaced this here with um boatloads of money <laughs> yeah so uh, ninja skills, boatloads of money, brooding, and, and an intimidating voice. So if we display the person after that, we're going to assume that because we gave Batman these powers that we're going to get some information about them. We, I say that we're going to assume this because we don't know. All we've said, all, we've, all we know about this so far is that we can create, we can give them powers, and we can display them. So let's, let's have a look at this running. So as I said, when we're compiling this program, we need to compile all the C files, um, but we don't compile any of the H files. The H files are only involved in the program if they are going to be, um, if they're going to be used, they're going to be included. So if they haven't been included, then they just won't be part of the program. But as long as in here, this is included, then we know that this person.h is going to end up part of the compilation process. So it's going to end up being processed by DCC, our compiler. We are, however, going to compile person.c. So I haven't even looked at person.c. We'll talk about that one in a second. But person.c has to fill out all of the information that was implied to exist when we said these functions would exist. If I compile this without person.c, we're going to have issues because these functions are just going to be empty functions with nothing in them. So they're not going to do anything that they said that they were going to do. It's like, this is my steering wheel, and if it's not connected up to the actual wheels of my car through all of the mechanics that happens there, then it doesn't do anything. And this is all the mechanics. So it's got all these other includes, and interestingly enough, it includes person.h as well. So it says, for me to do all of these things with the struct and all the code here, I need to know what I was supposed to do. So I need to know that I was supposed to make this function, I was supposed to make this function, etc. In the same way that if you just put the functions at the bottom of your code, but you didn't have the, um, you couldn't see the declarations of the functions at the top of your code, then you wouldn't really know why you are making those functions. They would exist, they would compile, but they would be kind of like self-contained floating little bits of code that you never access. So if we know that we've been told that these things exist, then we create the back end of those things that links them all back together so that when the main says, I have called this function, my computer is smart enough to go, yes, you can call that function because it exists here. Because you knew about it, in the include here. Then it'll go looking through the compiled code through all of this stuff and it'll say, oh yeah, I see where the important bits are for that. Now we're gonna run this line by line and make it work. So it's interesting how all this stuff kind of in interconnects but then it joins together into a working program. So we're compiling the main.c and the person.c and then this is going to be, um, I'm just gonna call it Batman. And this is why we start to get this thing of like, why were we doing this dash O and naming our programs after every compilation? So previously it didn't make much difference because we're doing things like this, where our entire C file had the name of our program. And then the, the dash O was just saying the same name because they were naming the same program. But if none of our C files actually name the program itself, that's why it's nice to have this thing to name the program something different. Okay. So let's run the Batman program. So the first thing it does is it prints out name Batman, powers, no powers. And I think it's writing this dotted line at the end so that we can see that that list is complete there. So that was this first two lines of code. This person still exists. And I'm now adding powers to that person and then here I'm displaying them again and we're seeing there's the name 
there's the powers, and there's the four powers that we added to it. So, we're at a position now where, similarly to how we use the standard input output library, we're able to use these functions that have been given to us by this H file without knowing what they are. So we don't know how they work. Uh, we don't know what the C code is to do them, but we can use them. And so one of the best things about these multi-file projects is I can be working with someone else on a, on a big code project and I work exclusively in this main file. And between the two of us, we've worked on this H file um, and the other person's working on this C file. So one person is providing this kind of functionality and I'm using the functionality the other person's provided to do something else. Um, and this way we're kind of kept out of each other's code. We don't even have to understand the other person's code. We just work on it, you know? So we get this situation where one person's working on the sequence of events that literally happen in the code, as in this is what happens in the main. It goes step by step through these things. And the other person's writing a whole series of things which are like, oh, if this person calls this function, um, I will do this. And if this person calls this function, I will do this. And in between is our agreement between the two of us that one person has to write the back end for this function and the other person uses this function assuming that that back end has already happened. And so you can kind of like separate the work like that between people. So I think that's one of the best things about this. And you're going to see this in, uh, in the second assignment where we're actually going to do a lot of the work alongside you in a sense. Like we're going to give you files that are half complete where we've done some of this stuff and we're going to say can you do some of this and we might even give you a main that you don't edit you don't edit the main function because we've already written it but you have to provide some of the code that actually runs these um uh, these actual functions here so i had a very very good question earlier which was in my main here what if i just knew what the struct was so I knew what struct person was. So let's have a look at it in the C file. Struct person has a string for the name, a two dimensional array here that has a certain number of character arrays, so a certain number of strings. And each one of those is, um, is the listing of the powers that the person has. And then we have an integer here that says, um, how many powers the person has. So there's a little detail. I mean, this is basically an array of strings and then a number tracking how many of them are in there. So something could be interesting if I was going to just sort of add powers to this Batman and I didn't have these functions and instead was given full access to this struct person. What if I wasn't sure about what was going on here that a person has a maximum number of five powers. And I start just going into that array and just adding things. Um, I could easily just go off the end of that array, this one here, and just add powers off the end of the array. Or if I didn't understand the code properly and I didn't update the number of powers someone has while they're doing it. So what I can do, if I have full access to this struct from the main and I'm not the person who's worried about um, this code file. I'm worried about this code file and I just start using it. Um, I can very easily corrupt the data for, for Batman here. So if I did stuff like, oh, I just go directly into that thing and start adding these strings in, but not updating the number for how many strings are in there, or I start trying to add more strings that can actually possibly be in there, because we in here know that there is a maximum number of strings, maximum powers. And if we look here, we can see that that maximum number is five. If I'm not careful, not thinking about it and start editing it, editing it, I can actually break stuff in here. So what we have instead is you do not have access to this array. You cannot change it yourself, but you can call this function called give power. Then the person who's working on this side of the project, for example, who is the custodian of this struct and knows how it's working, can say, there are only certain conditions under which we can add powers to this person. So what we will do is we will check the number of powers that the person has and make sure that the person currently has less than the maximum number of powers. If they have less than the current maximum number of powers, then we're going to add a power and we're going to add it in the next available slot so we know where we're adding these things and then we're going to increase their number of powers by one and then then you get this kind of system where this struct is is an open piece of data 
this C file can edit this struct however it wants. But the person working on this is really careful to say that um, only under certain conditions may you edit this thing. So it's nearly like this person makes a request and says, please give this, these powers to Batman. Um, and then they make a request of the capital P person, the concept here, and this one checks to make sure what they're doing is safe, and then does it, and then updates all the other bits and pieces that are necessary to keep everything consistent and clean. So what we're starting to do is we're starting to get to the point where we can write code where only certain parts of our code can break other parts of our code. So from our main, we can't break anything in the person.c because the only way into the person.c is through this interface, which is what we call the person.h. You can know that there's a capital P person and you can call these four functions because we've specifically not shown the main.c here because we include the person.h. We have never seen the person.c and cannot see person.c from main.c. It means we can't tell what this struct is, which means we can't dig into these details and accidentally um, cause problems in this struct. So this is really interesting, right? It's like I, I laid these out next to each other like this specifically. The person.h is the boundary between the other two files. So the main.c makes requests of the person.c file through these four specific questions and only through those four specific questions is it allowed to ask um, person.c to do stuff. And then person.c, every time it gets a request for something through those, it says, yeah, yeah, we can do this, but only if what you're asking is correct. So this give power one's really specific. So it's saying if the person has the capacity to have more powers, you will string copy in the power that you've given, which is this, the name of the power, into a specific location because we're managing this array and we know exactly where the next power should be and then we're updating how many powers we have so it's more than just sort of it's, it's much better than giving someone full access to the struct it's like saying no 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 you want you want to make changes to this thing that's okay but i'm managing this thing and i'm going to make it always neat and tidy it's always going to be correct and it's always going to be neat and tidy and if you make a request when the request can't be made this function's simply going to do nothing I mean, if I wanted to be much nicer, I could put some information in here and say, um, you could not add a power, this person already has a maximum number of powers or something like that, but I'm just keeping it sort of simple here, so it's like, you know, do nothing if the person already has a max number of powers, right? So we've got some information here saying what it is, and then here, it also has some information saying, we'll add a power to the person um, if the person still has space to add powers, you know? So we're not even being that specific here and saying there's five because um, this is the hash define here. It may change to other things, but we're gonna say that there's a limit. Um, and this is all the other person needs to know from the main side of the program for whether they can use it or not. Okay, so um, that is, I think I've just skipped a whole bunch of slides, but you know, like it, this is what I was talking about. If you wanna go back through the slides, the slides say the same thing that I was saying. So. We have um, the header file, and I was talking about that, um, the C file and what the difference was and what the main file is using. So when we're using the project, um, we're going to be compiling the, the C files and the hash includes are what are, is gonna give us access to the H file. So that's one thing to remember. Um, we are gonna be using multi-file projects in 1511 and assignment two is gonna have one in it, but we're not, um, necessarily for any of your assessment requiring you to build up this structure from scratch. Um, it's definitely going to be stuff that's useful to know. Um, it's definitely going to be stuff you're going to do in the future. Um, but for the moment, we're just going to give you as much familiarity as we can with these things um, rather than going um, uh, too deep into having, having you have to create them. So we want to give you some experience with using them. Um, but don't worry if you're like, whoa, this is really full on. Um, how would I even create something like this? That's that's a bigger question which you can work on later. Having said that, I think it would be quite interesting if, if someone wanted to um, take that Bender demo from yesterday and um, turn that into a multi-file project like this, because I think it would quite easily do that. In fact, 
I have done it with that in the past, actually. Okay, um... I think we'll go on break first. I was about to start launching into linked lists, but we won't do that yet because it's exactly five now. So we're going to take a five minute break and then I'll launch into the second half of the lecture, which we're going to talk about a particular kind of struct and how we're going to use it to organize data in a different way. So we'll take our break now and we'll come back at 5.05 .05 and we'll talk about the, the second half of what we're doing today.
Hey, I'm back. I'm a little early. Because someone came to say hello. Did you come say hello? She spent most of the break just kind of standing down there and meowing at me, so <laughs> I figured I figured I'd let her say hi to everyone. You can just wait, just move you out of the way of the microphone. Hmm. Off she goes. <laughs> it's unfortunate you didn't get to hear her talking because she was having like a full conversation with me a second ago. Chica, you want to say hello? Hello? No, nah, once she's up on the desk, she doesn't need to talk to me anymore. She's like on the on the ground. She's like, "Hey, pick me up. I want to come sit on the desk." <laughs> Alrighty. So that was our little talk on multi-file projects. That's not the last we're going to see of them. Um, we're going to have more detail on them, and then you'll get to know more about them as you start to use them. Uh, assignment two has this kind of setup in it, and we're going to go into more detail about what this actually means. So I just needed to introduce it to you. Um, but as you'll see, I do with a lot of things, the more complex something is, the more I will sort of drop the first um, piece of information about them and then we'll come back in a week or two and we'll look at it again. We'll go into more detail after you've had a chance to play around with them. Um, so questions <laughs> on the ground. Someone's asking how old Chicken is. Chicken is like 10 or 11 years old. She's actually, um, she's actually quite an old cat. Okay, uh, now that we're, break is definitely over, let's move on. So I have other things I want to talk about today. So I want to introduce to you a new kind of struct. So this is the, uh, the next storyline in comp 1511 that is going to go through a lot of um, a lot of interesting things a lot of learning about these new concepts and I've, I've already kind of like talked this up a fair bit saying that I was going to talk about it so it's a struct we looked at structs yesterday and we know that structs have the capability of containing um, multiple variable types of any type you know so I have this thing thing here now it's a node and it contains some information. So I've got an integer here for data. So this is just some information that's in the node. It doesn't have to be the only thing. The interesting thing about this struct, the thing that makes it most um, strange and also incredibly useful, is it has a pointer to another struct that is the same type as itself. So if I can have a struct that points to another struct that is identical to itself, that means I can connect structs together. So I can say, from this struct, you can find this other struct. And in this other struct, because it was the same as this one, it also has a pointer to another struct. And then that one has a pointer to another. And then you can actually start to build together a chain of these things. So to make this thing, this, this new data structure that we call a linked list, we are going to have a pointer to a node. So we're always probably going to need to grab that first node via a pointer, unless this first node is declared somewhere where you know its name, um, but very often we're gonna do it with a pointer. And then inside this, there's some information, and then there's a next pointer that says, all right, there's another node. And then we go, okay, there's another node. This one has its own information. It has a next pointer to another node, et cetera, et cetera, until we reach the end of our chain of nodes, our, link, uh, our linked list, and we say, this one said, that its pointer wasn't pointing at anything. So it had a null pointer in it instead of a pointer to another node. Then we go, okay, this one must have been the last one in the list. It still has some information, but it says, look, I'm pointing to null, uh, there's no more information. So what we can actually do is we can grab all of these pieces of memory and put pointers in them to other pieces of memory. And then we can actually chain together these, um, um, these pieces of information. So each thing in here is a piece of piece of data so it can be um like in this example just an integer but like in other examples we've built other structs with much more information than that in them uh slight hint in assignment two you'll be working on these things and adding much more information than just an integer into each one of these nodes and we're going to have nodes and connections of them um linked together like that so these things are called linked lists 
And you might be asking yourself this interesting question, right? Like, why is Mark bothering to teach us this? Because that, if we looked at this thing, is just an integer, and then another integer, then another integer, and another integer. Why aren't we just using arrays? Like, why is Mark bothering to teach us this thing? This thing appears to have pointers, structs, and he was talking about memory. So this has got pointer structs and memory allocation in it. Why is Mark doing pointer structs and memory allocation just for an array? And you know this by now, right? If I'm going to ask a big question like that, I obviously already know the answer. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you about it. So interesting thing about the difference between arrays and linked lists and why we might use them for different purposes. So arrays are usually just one big chunk of memory with everything next to each other. Um, that gives them the niceness of you know being really easy to access. We've talked about how indexes are really just kind of jumping through memory. Um, but if we think about that, if I wanted to remove an element from the middle of the array and have all the others kind of just shuffle in and fill that space, um, they can't really do that. You can do it, but it takes a lot of programming effort to make that happen. So they're, they're sort of fixed in that. They're inflexible in their convenience. We can shuffle around objects. So if I wanted to, I could just go, ooh, this next pointer points at this object, this next pointer points at this object, this one points at null, and I'm just reordering stuff just by moving these pointers around. That's one nice thing we can do. The other thing about linked lists is they don't have a fixed length. All of these arrays, sorry, where are we? All of these arrays that we've been working on, um, they've all had this kind of like, what is this specific size of this thing? Each of these things has a specific maximum length, which is hash defined here and stuff like that. So they all have a limitation, you know? Every array we create either has a limitation of how big uh, it could be, or we have to make it really big just in case something could go into it. Whereas when you look at this diagram of a linked list, if I want to add nodes to this, I just declare memory somewhere and then point this at it and then declare more memory and point it at it and just keep doing that until maybe I run out of memory. So maybe the, the, the theoretical upper limit on the size of this linked list is eight gigabytes of memory, like we looked at the other day when I used up too much memory. So that's, that's the only limit. It doesn't have the same limitations as an array for its maximum size. Um, I said already, yeah, we can remove or add things anywhere in the list. So if you tried to say, add a number at the start of the array, and what I mean is not replace the number that's at the start of the array, but add a new number at the start of the array, you'd kind of have to go through and copy all the current elements of the array one further along and then put the new one at the start. It's, it's a laborious kind of process. Um, whereas a linked list is just going to be, yeah, sure, I'll make a new one of these and I'll put it at the beginning and then I'll attach its pointers to this thing and we're good, we're done. We've added a new one without having to affect any of the other bits and pieces. So. Those are some of the reasons why we might use a linked list instead of an array. Um, we're still going to be using arrays for other things because arrays have a, a level of convenience to them. But there's a lot of cases where we might use linked lists instead. So this is the first time that I'm kind of giving you two mechanisms for doing the same thing. I hinted at that when I gave you things like getchar, putchar, fgets, and, and fputs, as opposed to just printf and scanf. That was like, oh, there are different ways of doing the same thing. And the subtle differences of the ways that we can do stuff might lead us to decide to use different things in different circumstances, right? So the linked list can be used for circumstances where flexibility is very important. And an array can be used in circumstances where um, just sort of convenience is important because you know there's le it's less complex to code them. So we're gonna be coding lots of stuff on linked lists for basically the rest of the term. This is this is the big this is the big finale <laughs> of of one five one one basically is we're gonna be going through these linked lists and learning all about how they work. So um, we're not going on break now because <laughs> we've been on break. So if I'd done this beforehand, then we could have looked at this meme for the break. The trick is linked lists are tying together everything that we've learnt over the past sort of three weeks. We've been we've been looking at pointers and we went over pointers more than once because it's kind of important to learn about them. Um, and then we looked at structs and we looked at memory allocation and we're tying all of this together now into one big thing where it's like um, structs with pointers that point back at themselves in a sense allow us to combine them together into these lists. Okay, so how are these things working in code? Um, 
if we just want to have the simplest possible list, all we need is a struct for a node. So this is the node struct, and in it, it has a pointer to another node struct, and then some information that it's carrying there. Um, some people call this the payload. Uh, some people call it the information. It's like the node, the stuff that allows it to connect to other nodes, and the stuff that's the actual information it's carrying. So for the moment, we could do this with just integers. We're immediately going to do this with more than just integers in today's example when we start building it. So we've got this, but it doesn't work on its own. We need ways of connecting these things together. So we're going to need a package of functions that are going to work for this. And you can see already how if I was going to do these things often, um, I would potentially use the multi-file project thing and say to someone else, I will manage the linked list and how it connects to the other nodes. And I will give you a series of functions you can use, like create the list add to the list, remove from the list and things like that. Um, and so someone else would only see those functions and I would see the internals of the list and I would manage them, right? So we can we can do this kind of back and forth like that. So bit of code, um, we've seen creating a struct before. This is no different because it's still a struct. So I have this line here which people, as we do more memory allocation, are going to become very, very familiar with this line because it's going to be nearly exactly the same every time we use it. We create a pointer to a particular type, and this type is a, a node structure. We, so we're creating a pointer to a node structure. In this case, we're calling it n because I think when we're creating it, we have no specific notion of what it's going to be yet. So we're just calling this one n. Um, I'd be interested if the style tool doesn't like it for <laughs> me doing this. <laughs> and then we memory allocate the amount of space necessary, size of, of that same type. So we're grabbing a piece of memory to store a node structure. And then memory allocation is going to tell me exactly where it left it. So it's going to give me a memory address for where it created this memory. So standard thing, we're going to be using these a lot. Hello, computer, I would like a piece of memory. The computer says here. Here's a piece of memory. Here is the address where that piece of memory is. Don't lose that address because you're going to lose the memory if you lose that address. And I'm like, great. I will store that address and my create node function will give that address back. So it's the same type here, the node pointer and the node pointer here. More than that, if I want to do some extra stuff, I can um, put information in. So the two things that were in the struct is a next pointer. So struct node pointer next. So we're just going to call that next. It's the, it's the thing that allows us to find other nodes and it's got some data. So what I can do is I can say the new node that I've just created, it's data is whatever data you gave me and it's next pointer is whatever pointer you gave me. So what I'm saying is when I, um, when I write a function to create a node, um, I'm expecting that whoever calls this function tells me what I need to know. So what are, you wanting, what are you wanting to store in that node and how does it connect to other nodes? So we're relying on whoever calls this function to actually piece this list together. Um, if we have only that function, if we have that function and nothing else, we can actually create a list. It's a weird way of doing it. This is not the way we generally would create a list. Um, but if this is the simplest way of doing things, we can make a linked list. So I'm actually counting backwards in here for a reason. I'll show you in a second. I have I have a lot of pictures. Once once we get into linked lists, there's going to be heaps of pictures because I would draw lots of pictures for um, how linked lists work because they really are a kind of a, a theoretical um, concept that also has a coding concept. But if you only look at the code, it's really hard to understand the theoretical side of it. So what I've done here is I've made a pointer called head. Um, we will use this head pointer a lot. So this is this is a, a, a word that we use as a convention in C. Um, and so this says the head is always the start of the list. So it's always considered the first node in the list. So if I've created this head node and I set it to a node that I've created. And so I've created a node that is the number five and its pointer is null. So the pointer being null means that it is the last element of the list. So when I've only run this one line, the head pointer points at the first node of the list, um, which has its, um, its pointer pointing to null. It's going to look just like this. So I've got these images here for how, how this whole thing works. So create node makes a node and with a null next. So the next pointer is null. 
and then we point the head pointer at it. So I've got a head pointer pointed at this node, its next is null. And then the next line of code here, which is going to be doubled up, is I'm going to call the create node function with a new node and its next pointer is going to point at whatever the head is. So at the moment, the head is this node 5. Node 4 is going to point at node 5. But then whatever comes out of this create node, which is the fourth node, is going to overwrite what used to be the head. So what it does is it says, I'm the new node. When I'm the new node, I'm going to point at which one had been the head before, which is the number 5. And then um, I'm going to overwrite what had been the head to be me now. So it works like this. We, we've done the first line and we've created a node. We've pointed our head pointer at it. And its next node points at null. This is a valid linked list. It has only one element in it, but it is a valid linked list because it has the head pointer pointing at a node and the final node in the list has its next pointer pointing at null. So this is going to be valid. And when I teach you about looping through lists and stuff like that, this thing will still work. So then when I create the new one, the new one points its next pointer at the previous node. So this is the previous node and its next pointer copies the head. So the head um, partway through the program is still pointing at this. But then when that's when this part of this line happens. So we use the previous head and we say we're pointing at that. And then after that, we take the the output of this function, which is the pointer to the node that was just created, and we say this is now the head. So after we've added this for node, then the head pointer ends up pointing at this one. And we can keep doing this. So we can keep saying, make a new node, point its next at whatever's the current head of the list, and then move the head of the list to that. And we can add the third one on, and so on and so forth until like you can just keep adding nodes because as long as you've got this head pointer you know that you can create a node that links up to the start of this list um adding nodes anywhere else in the list is harder and we're going to talk about that but with this theory of being able to change where these pointers aim and being able to create these nodes you actually already have the tools to do all kinds of different things with these lists having said that it's going to be it's going to be better if i explain them all one at a time but we have this at least the next thing we're going to think about is how do we go through this list how do we read these numbers so after i've put all of these in like this uh, I just happen to do them reversed like this. I should end up with a list where one is the head and there's one, two, three, four, five in the list. But what I haven't shown you is how we're actually going to loop through a list and look at all the information in there. And arrays, arrays are really easy to loop through because they're indexed by numbers. So it's really easy to be indexed by numbers if all you're doing is saying, zero is the first one, one is the next one, two is the next one, because there are no indexes in linked lists. We have to find another way to loop through them. So what we're going to do to loop through a linked list is we're going to use pointers. So pointers are good because we know that each node in this list, because if we go back to this, we know that each node in this list is allocated memory. So everything that's allocated memory has a pointer to it. So allocated memory has a pointer to it, which means that we know the memory address of each single node in this list. Um, and we've collected them together because each next knows the memory address of the next node. So this node knows through its next pointer where the next one is. This one knows where the next one is. So looping through is going to be a matter of following these pointers one after the other until the pointer is null. When the pointer is null, we know that there are no more uh, nodes in the linked list. So here's our looping code. Um, and this is going to be some basic looping code that we're going to be using a lot, but I should talk through it and, and, and tell you how this works, right? So this is something that's going to print out the information in each node. So we don't really need to think about the, the printf line here because that's just the processing. But the loop itself says, we get given a node pointer n. What we're assuming is when we first get given that node pointer, it's the head of the list. 
because that's the only point of anywhere here that we're kind of saving outside. It's like, okay, we need to be able to access the list. We need to be able to refer to the list. We're gonna to refer to it through its head pointer. So if we get the head pointer, then we look at it and we say, are you null? Because a null head pointer would mean that, yes, technically, I guess we have a linked list, but we don't have any nodes in the linked list. So if the, if the pointer is null, then we don't have any nodes in the list. The other case for the pointer being null is we've already looped through multiple times and we've reached a point where the next pointer was null. So what we do is we check if it's null. If it's not null, then we know that there's a node. We know that this node pointer n is aimed at an actual node because it's not null. So it has a memory address that we're following. So if it does, we can do something with that particular node. And this is like access the data that's inside that node and print it out, right? fairly standard, this line here. I think we've seen this kind of thing before. But then we say, how do we move on through this while loop? And we say, how do we decide where we're going next? And this is where we say, the node that we're in right now is n. Let's look at one of the fields inside that node. And we look at the next field inside that node. The next field inside that node is another memory address. And so we say, all right, replace the n, because the n's a pointer to a node. So we're gonna move on to another node by copying the next pointer as our n, and then we're gonna check if that next node exists. If it does, we work on it. Again, pictures are gonna help here. So here's a linked list. This is a really simple linked list. It's only got two nodes in it, but it's set up the same way we had before. So we've got the nodes, and we have the next pointer in between them. So we start with a pointer that's a copy of the head. And this is how we're gonna get this here. Because this n, it's in a function, right? So it's a copy of a pointer. It is not the head pointer. It is the n pointer, because it's not head, it doesn't have the name head, it's n, but we're probably going to give it the head to start with. Um, and so this is this red pointer here. And it is a copy of the head, which means it's pointed at the same node as the head. So copies of addresses lead us to the same place, which is here. Um, and then it does something with the data in there. Then, when we move on from this to the next one, we say, hey, node that I'm looking at right now, what is your next? And its next is aimed at this node here. So I say, all right, I'm going to copy your next, which is the address of this next node, and say, that's my new address. And so that's how we move the pointer from this to this. So it's always really weird, right? Because we're doing this, like, in pictures like this. And oftentimes when I'm working on linked lists and stuff like that, I like to draw pictures because it makes it so much easier to understand what's going on. So we have this. And what that was, was me doing something with the node itself and saying n equals n next. Because n next is me saying, I would like to read the memory address of the next node and I'm gonna store it in my pointer. So what I did was my pointer used to be here until I read the next in here and I replaced the pointer with this memory location. So the pointer is now aimed at this memory location because it followed this pointer into the next one. So when you think about it visually, it's pretty easy to understand that you're just moving this pointer along these nodes. But then you need to understand that the translation of moving that red pointer is this line of code, n equals n next. So I'm replacing what had been the memory address stored in the n pointer here with the memory address that's stored in this next pointer, which gives me access to this node. So I do that with the first one, I do it again with the second one. So I do something with its data and I say, okay, I'm moving this along. So when I move this along here, it is no longer pointed at that node, but I read the next from that node and that next, this in this case here, happens to be null. And so my pointer is now pointing pointing at null. It's, you can't really point at null. You're pointing at something that doesn't exist, but I like to do it in the diagrams here so we can understand what's happening. Both of these pointers are pointed at null, um, which means neither of them is pointing at anything in particular. So when this is pointed at null, we then fail this condition of the while loop. The condition of the while loop says n can't be null for me to be able to continue. So we drop out of the while loop and we say we're done, which is good because our pointer has just left the linked list entirely and gone off the end of the linked list. So we definitely shouldn't be doing any more processing of the list once we've gone off the end of it here. So, so that's the, the 
the complete cycle from start to finish of how we would loop through a linked list. And it's, and it's really interesting because there's just so much going on when you look at it visually like this, but in code, it's just this one line. <laughs> so it's just testing and then iteration. When you think about their old like lists doing I++, we can think of this copy of the head pointer as being the I equals zero because I equals zero is like starting at the beginning of, a, of an array. You could say that's the head of the array. And then this checking for n is not equal to null is saying, have we gone off the end of the array? Because we know in the arrays how long they are, but in the linked lists, we know what signifies the end of the list. And then this is our I++ move the pointer on to the next one. So that's our, um, that's our kind of code and how it goes back and forth between this abstract idea and then the actual code itself that's going to run. And I think honestly, that's the most difficult thing about linked lists is trying to go from these diagrams to the code, because there's a lot of kind of, when you think about it, has anyone seen those, um, those memes about like how to draw an owl? They was like, oh, first you draw like these two circles, then draw the rest of the owl. That's what it feels like sometimes um, when working with linked lists, because you go, how did we get to this? This is so simple, yet it does the, all of that stuff somehow. And it's like, how does all of this stuff happen in this little bit of code? And, and that's, the, that's the understanding, and that's the, the, the kind of time and practice it's going to take to be able to do those things. Yeah. Yeah, so someone's saying, yeah, yeah. Step three, question mark. Step four, owl. Yeah. So I understand it looks like this now, but I'm going to show you how we do all, of, all the single brush strokes, all the single pen strokes that actually get us there. Um, you just have to be patient with me because it takes some time and it's going to be in your tutorials and, and labs and stuff like that. So you get a lot more practice with this. Okay. So now I'm going to start the example and this example is, is a big one. We're definitely not going to finish it in this half hour that we have left today. Um, I think we're going to spend the half hour here and we're going to do it next lecture and the lecture after. So it's like, it's like a trilogy. This is, this is why, um, uh, I called this one episode one, a new struct. Which is a Star Wars joke. Anyway, so let's, cause I like, I like games. So we're going to, we're going to do this one on a game. So it's a battle Royale game. So I'm sure that people have played some battle Royale games. Uh, I think Fortnite is the most famous example, but if you've played um, what's known as PUBG, player unknown battlegrounds, it's the idea that you have a whole lot of people in a game. Um, and they all get knocked out one at a time until only one person is remaining. And that's the person that wins the game. So what we're going to do is build a linked list program that tracks players in a game. So the linked list is going to be the list of all the players in the game. And we're going to be able to remove them one at a time from this list until there's only one person left. So we're going to start simple by adding players to the game. And when you think about it, we've already got this code. We've got this really simple way of saying, if we have a function to create a node where we can put in the information in the pointer, we could conceivably put together a list of people like that. Um, and then we're going to be able, want to be able to print out all the players that are in the game again. We have already looked at some code that can do this. So there's some things that we can do, but we're going to have to talk through this and actually put it together because once we get deeper into this, we may want the order of the list to be specific. So we may want to be able to insert into particular positions in the list based on the ordering. Um, but also for this to work for this kind of battle royale thing, we have to be able to find people in the list and then remove them. So if, if a bunch of us are playing this game and we're all known by our names in this game, so say I get knocked out of the game, someone, well not someone, the program has to look through the linked list and find the node that has my name in it. So okay, which, which of these nodes has Mark in it? That node has to be removed from the list. And we're gonna look at what it means to insert nodes into these lists and remove nodes from these lists um, next week in the lectures and also the memory management, right? Because we do need to free nodes when we're finished with them. So that means every time we remove nodes, we have to free them as well. So that's why I said we were, we were gonna cover freeing memory later as well. But for today, we're gonna start by building the list of players. So we're gonna need a function that creates the players and we're gonna need a function that adds players to the list. I'm not sure if we're even gonna use a function to add them. We could just do it. 
Um, but we're also going to need a function that print out, prints out the players in the list. Not sure how deep we're going to get into this today. We're going to do some of this stuff, definitely. So let's look at our nodes. So instead of these being called uh, the word node, um, we're going to call them players because it's just a little bit easier for us to understand that. So it's a node struct that has a name in it. So let's get going into this. Actually, I might just close this, get out of my multi-file project. Yep. I actually have the demo code for the linked list is here in the linked list.c. But we're going to start a new one. Battle Royale.c. We're going to spend a lot of time in this file, by the way. <laughs> I might just once, because I haven't been doing this much, is just use a block comment up here. Um, I have an instinct of just doing the double slash comments all the time, and then I realize that I've done like a six line comment. It would have been much easier with the block comment. So a linked list example that tracks players in a game. Um, we want to be able to maintain the list as well as remove players as they are knocked out. Some punctuation. Um, we also want to be able to display who is currently still in the game. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, obviously, we're not going to get it all done in half an hour. Um, this is made by me. Um, <laughs> April 1st. I don't usually... Um, use very very specific dates because I know that most of the time when I'm writing programs it takes me more than one day but this one was a funny date um, and I freaked everyone out at the start of the lecture with it so I thought it would be um uh, it would be funny to say this one was an April 1st oh hello no what she, not sure what she's doing but she's just investigating things okay um, I'm going to move my code across so that Chicken and myself on camera don't block it that much. Um, I don't think I need anything else here, so I will end my comment there. I just tabbed these in. It's not necessarily... Like, you don't have to be super, super careful about it in the comments, but that looks okay like it is. Um, I won't be doing this one as a multi-file project just because um, I think we want to, to grasp the the difficulty of the linked list without having to also add on the multi-file project stuff but your assignment will throw both of those in so it's linked list and multi-file projects um okay so i know i'm gonna want my main i'm going to have to include some stuff so i'm gonna need the standard library because the standard library um, is going to be all about um, the memory management that I'm going to need. I also know that we want to be able to display who's currently in there, so I'm pretty sure I will also need my standard input output. Um, you'll note that in heaps of programs that people um, uh, the, the, um, that people write in C, they sometimes include these things without even thinking about what the function of the program is. They're just like, look, I'm going to use them. We're always going to end up using these things. So they just include these things on instinct. Um, okay. In order to get this working, in order for me to make a linked list, I do need my struct. So I need my player node struct. I'm going to call it player rather than node because I think that makes sense. The things that are necessary for the... Oh, it's good. The camera can still see me while it's focusing on, on chicken. I have no idea what chicken's looking at. I think she's just doing the thing that cats do, where if they sit next to you and look away from you, it means that they trust you because they don't need to watch you to be safe. 
Um, okay, so the player struct, the important thing to link these nodes together is it has a pointer to another um, player node. So struct player pointer, this is the type of the variable that's going to be one of the fields of this struct, and we're going to call that next. So remember, this is the thing when we're doing structs and pointers, this whole thing is the type in the same way that an integer would be the type, and this is the name of the variable. Um, the other thing we're going to have is the player's name. So let's do a, an array of characters called name, and we need to decide how big this is going to be, because in the definition of the struct, it needs to know exactly how big this is. So as always, if I'm going to have something that's going to ride through a lot of my program for the size of an array, then it needs to be a hash define so that I could change it just with one change rather than having to, um, having to go through and change numbers that are floating around in there. So I'm going to say max name length. It's a bit wordy, but we'll get away with that. I think that's okay. Let's say 100. Oops. <laughs> I, love I just, just did that just entirely wrong as I did that. <laughs> as, I did, as I created the hash define and then just didn't use it. Okay, so max name length. So we know that it's unlikely for someone's gamer tag to be longer than 100 characters. And if it is, I think um, they're going to have problems with people communicating with them in game. Um, okay, so this is my struct. This is the hash define that allows it to work, which means we can now start using that struct in here if we want to. However, what I want to do is make a function that creates a player. So it's going to be create player. And I know that in order to create the player, I'm going to need its next pointer and, and, and its name. So let's do the name first. Um, Did I call it new name? And I don't actually need to say the length of this in here, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in here anyway to remind whoever's using it, if they read this, that there was a limit on how big this string could be. Um, and then it's going to be a player pointer. Next, there. I'm not done here because I haven't yet said what this gives back. And I know that if it's going to make a new player, it needs to give us access to that player because we're going to memory allocate this thing. So if we don't get a pointer out of this, um, we're not going to um, we're not going to be able to know where it was that that memory was allocated. So we know that this is a player pointer function. So I've gone just over my maximum line width there, but I think that's okay, because it's only just over. Um, could be a problem if if it was super important what was on the other side of the line, but it's just the closing bracket, so I think that's okay. So I'm going to copy that with control C, and come down here under the main and start creating this function. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is obviously explain this function which is um, allocate memory for a player node. Populate that node with um, new name. In fact, I don't want to call this next. I want to call it new next. So now I have made it kind of too big for that. I'm going to bring this down and that. So now it's kind of, uh, it's, so readability, I've definitely got a readability issue here because this is the struct and this looks exactly the same, but it's not another struct. It's a function. Okay. Hopefully those headings will allow me to tell them apart. This will be a little bit more readable because you, now you can see exactly what the two variable names are. Um, I'm going to need to do that down here as well. Okay, so we still have our... Actually, 
it's getting a little awkward for readability here. But maybe this is going to be okay. I still have my opening bracket and closing brackets there, which are on lines that are at the same indentation as the original thing, and I can indent inside the bracket. So yeah, it's a little messy, but it's okay. Um, someone's saying type def. We could type def this. Because um, if we type def the struct player, uh, the struct player pointer as a capital P player, that's actually a nice way of doing things because that's going to be similar to how things are going to work in a multi-file project. So let's do that. We could actually like lower the, the overhead of stuff that we need to type in if we're doing that. So struct player pointer player, capital P player. This is not actually doing the multi-file abstraction thing which stops us from accessing the struct because it's all in the same file, but it does make it a little bit more convenient. So instead of using the pointer the whole time, I can use this capital P player here. I don't know if I necessarily want to change this one to the capital P player because I want this one to be really clear that it's a pointer. But that one, I guess we can give back a player there. So let's see, I think we're going to fit now here. Yes. Alrighty. Put this back up here. There we go. So as long as we remember that the capital P player is um, the address of a player, I guess I could put it here as well. Uh, let's do it. While we're using it like that, we will. But we just have to remember that this is a pointer and this is a pointer. Okay, so we're gonna populate that with new name and new next. We're going to return the, return a pointer to the allocated memory. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, um, Oh, Jeffrey's asking if all of this is going to a different file. We're not necessarily going to do that, but that could actually be a good challenge for you if you want to. Um, do what I'm doing now, but see which of the which parts of this should go in the H file, which parts of it should go in another C file, and which parts of it should be in a main.c, because I could see exactly how we would move this, right? This is in the C file. This is in the H file. Wait. This is in the H file and the main file is still pretty much empty at the moment. But anyway, let's get back to coding. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff we can do with that. We may even do it later as an exercise if I get time. Okay, so we're gonna create the player, which means we need to do a malloc. Memory allocation. The amount of memory that we are allocating is that of a struct player. So we're not gonna use the capital P because capital P is a pointer. And I'm not allocating the memory for a pointer, I'm allocating the memory for the entire struct. I need to then store that in a pointer. So we're gonna use the capital P player to be the pointer. Um, let's call this the new player. So the new player is going to be a piece of memory big enough to hold a player and it has a player pointer aimed at it. So the new player has inside it both a next pointer and a name. So its next pointer is going to be a copy of new next. And then the new player's uh, name is going to be a copy of this new name. So I can't just do this because I can't just make one string equal to another like that. I have to use a string copy here. So I'm gonna string copy these like so. In order to use string copy, string copy being a library, uh, being a library function, uh, I need to have its library. Pfft. That's not it. <laughs> 
I love how like I get caught up between coding and then talking about coding at the same time and then I write down something I was saying instead of the code I was thinking of. Okay, so that's the library that allows me to do string copy. So what I have done, I've allocated memory for the player node. I've populated that node with the name and the new name and the new next. Then I need to return a pointer to the allocated memory. This new player is the pointer to the allocated memory. So the only thing that I need to do is return new player. So this should now be, um, give us the capability of creating um, a single player, but also because it creates with a pointer, I should be able to join these up. So it's, it's not much different to this, where I could now create a list of players. So this is my create player. This is pretty much the same code. Yep, I just did this one without the type defs. Um, so if we want to now, we can create a list of players. And so I've put some characters in here based on, on yesterday's lecture. So first thing I'm gonna do is say there is a head. So this is a pointer to the start of the list. So we're using this capital P here. Capital P player is the same as struct player pointer. So I'm just, I'm gonna put this in a comment because I think this is the first demo I've done with this. Uh, so I think it's good for me to explain it. I'll put these in quotes so it's a bit easier to understand. So player is now the same thing as struct player pointer. Just makes it a little easier for us to read now. And we can start to think of it as an abstract concept uh, of a player rather than necessarily having to say, okay, it's a pointer to a player struct. We can think of the capital P player as always being a pointer to a player struct. So pointer to a player struct called head is equal to whatever the first um, element of the linked list is. And so we're gonna create the first element of the linked list using the create player function. Create player function is going to take in a name. So I'm going to put myself in first, first player in the game. And there's no other players in the game. There's nothing else I can point at. So the next is null. So if I want to add another player to the game, obviously she's sitting right here. She wants to join the game. Um, uh, the head now is chicken. So she's the new player. Then, if the head is now going to be chicken, she needs to point to me, who is the other element of the list. And the only way to get access to me is the knowing that I used to be the head. So if I was the head, this part of the line actually gets done before this part of the line. So this function would run and chicken could then point her next at the head. So. This is what's happening in this particular example. So first line here, we create player. So we've got this head pointer and the head pointer gets pointed at this create player, which is me. And my next pointer points at null. I'm giving null some space, but it doesn't really, doesn't really exist. Um, and then the next line creates a player called chicken. So chicken gets created here. Chicken gets populated with her name, obviously, but then she gets her, um, next pointer to be a copy of head. So for a pointer to be a copy of another pointer, it aims at the same thing. So heads pointed at mark. Chicken's next pointer is also pointed at mark. Then the next thing that happens is the head becomes the output of this function. So the output of this function is the address of chicken. So the head pointer no longer points at me. It now points at chicken. So we get this kind of thing where we start building up this linked list like that. So the first line of code created me. Um, with me pointing at null and the head pointing at me. 
so the player head was created pointing at me. Then Chicken is created with her next pointer pointing at me, using what had been the head to do that, and then moves where the head pointer is. So basically, any time where we assign a value to a pointer, what we're doing is we're changing where it aims. Okay. Um, so this is using create. Oh, right. I had I had slides for all of this stuff, but you know, drawing it is also nice as well. So the next thing we can do is we can print out the list of players. So we can have a function that's going to print players. So the first thing we need to do is put it in our functions, and for it to know who it's going to print out, it needs to be given the head of the list. So I'm actually going to call it head here. I think so it's obvious that the input is the head of the list naming conventions for functions like this uh, change depending on who you're working with sometimes so uh, takes the head of the list prints out everyone who is in the list so this is going to be pretty simple it's going to loop through the list and just print out everything. So what I might do is be a little bit more explicit with this than I would be normally. Usually I just use this pointer, but I'm going to show you like one thing that we would sometimes do is the head of the list refers to what is the first element in the list. And then when we're doing loops like this, we would often say um, current or even shorten it to car. It's short for current, but I'll just do the full name here. Current is equal to head. So I've just made a pointer that points at the first element of the list, but I'm being explicit for readability to say, this is the thing I'm currently looking at is the head. And then I'm going to loop through the list. So while the current is not null, I'm looking at a valid player if the current isn't null then to move on to the next player current is going to be equal to current next so what i'm going to say is if i want to move from one player to the next i'm going to find out what the address is of the next player and copy that over my current player so then my current pointer then moves on to the next player so in between these i'm going to do something with the current player. So I'm going to do a printf here that says um, just the name of the current player. So I'm going to do the percent %s, which is actually the string. Um, be careful, you can do percent percent %s when you're printing out, but if you try to do percent %s when you're doing scanf, things are going to go real bad. So don't use this symbol for scanf, uh, but you can use it for printing out. So printf Oh, I'm going to put a new line on the end of it so that everyone's on their own line. Um, that is going to be the current player's name. I think it was just name, right? Char name, yes. So current player's name printed out, and so all the players will get listed out on their own line each. Um... Okay, I don't think this function needs anything else. So let's add a few more players. I'm just going to copy the line actually, and then change the names of the people who are in there. So I put these in the slides because we were like, who would win between these people? And now we can play with that. Okay, so we just have these four players in this list. So. If we run this, we won't know anything about what's happening because there's no information coming out with this stuff. I Hopefully there's memory allocations happening and all this kind of stuff, but we don't 100% know yet. So we need to call the print players function using the head of the list as the input to that function. This should hopefully loop through the list and print out these names. And you'll see these names should go in reverse order because every time we added a new player, we made them the head of the list and we made whoever else was the head of the list their next. So every time we're adding someone, we're squeezing them in at the front of the list. So let's compile this and see if it compiles first. I'm going to shorten it to battle. 
Okay, that's scary. It's always scary when you write this much code and it compiles. Um, basically, it means that the errors that you've made are logical rather than syntax errors. But we'll see when we run this what my errors were. I'm also counting a little bit on um, uh, on on chat. So if people are going to tell me whether I've made a mistake, okay. Battle. So Goku's first, then Aang, then Chicken, and then myself. So we can see that we have been able to create a linked list. This is building it up in reverse order. We've also been able to loop through it and and print out all the names in it. Someone saying chicken obviously wins. Okay, so that's where we're at at the moment. So I'm going to say to be continued. Uh, chicken just ran away. So back to me. <laughs> um, it's a big project. We're going to be looking at more of this later. Um, there's other things we might want to do where what if we want to insert people at certain points in the list? Um, and um, maybe we want to do something like alphabetical order for these. Um, and we also haven't looked at what happens when we remove like a single person from this list and stuff like that. So we're going to be building this up over multiple lectures. But this is the start. So the start is we have the struct, which contains a pointer to another player and some information. Here is their name. We have a function to create and a function that loops through them. So here's the basics so far. We can build a linked list and we can loop through it. Um, so we're out of time for today. We'll wrap it up there. Um, and um, we will next week start delving deeper into this. In fact, next week we might actually split this up into a multi-file project because it might be fun to actually work on this as a multi-file project over the next couple of weeks. So we might start by splitting it and then um, we'll continue adding functionality to it. Alrighty, I'm going to wrap up the main lecture there. Stick around if you want to ask some questions about this code. I fully understand if you have more questions about this. I know that lots of stuff has been going on in the chat there. So hopefully Tom's answered most of your questions there. You've answered each other's questions and stuff. But I'll still stick around and answer any other questions if people have them. Alrighty, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone that came along outside of the normal schedule as well. I'm just going to assume that most people are going to watch this afterwards uh, rather than... Uh, <laughs> that wasn't me turning off the stream the stream just died temporarily <laughs> but hopefully i'm back now yeah it looks like i'm back now okay <laughs> um i will just going to be right back um chicken also came to say hi again and um and i'll come back in a second to answer questions All right, I thought I'd just hop straight back in because <laughs> I was like, I was going to take a break, but then I was like, no, let's just hop back in. Let's keep going. All right, let's 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 finish off what we're doing today. Chicken's still walking around here. Actually, I'll just... She's just looking out for the... Um, looking out for the... Just in case someone else is coming in the door. <laughs> Okay, so questions. Waleed was asking, when we do a multiple file project, why can't we access a struct that was malloced in a different C file? Like in the example, we can't directly access the hero power, right? We need a function. Yeah. So let's let's open it back up. Oh oops. <laughs> I just tried to open even the running file. So let's close that one and we don't need the backup file either. So when you consider how uh, hash include works, hash include works by basically taking the other file and copy pasting it where the hash include is. So person.h file, it'll take all of this stuff and it'll copy paste it here in the C file. So when the compiler is looking at the C file, it'll go, um, I can see all of these function declarations. I don't know necessarily what's in those functions, but I can see all the declarations. 
Um, so it just sees them all there. So it says, yeah, you can you can call those functions so long as you have the right inputs. Um, we don't know exactly how they're going to work. Um, when the when the program runs, then it will be able to see everything that's in the C files, and it'll say is there a function somewhere in this program that lines up with this name? And he goes, well, let's look through. Yes, there is a function that lines up with that name. Here is the lines. Here are the lines of code that we're actually going to run when this thing gets called. But otherwise, it doesn't know any of that stuff because the only code that it can see is person.h. It cannot see person.c in advance. So for the compiler running through the main file, and there's no guarantee that the C file would get compiled before the main file. So as you see, when I compiled that, I actually compiled the main file first. So there are two independent, where did I compi compile it? Two independent files that both get compiled without any knowledge of each other because there's no connection because neither one has a hash include of the other. By the way, never hash include C files. It's super, super dangerous, shouldn't be done. So um, we hash include the H files only. So here we get the um, the access to the function declarations, but no access to the actual definition of the struct. So if somewhere in this, I knowing that the struct exists, I try to do something like uh, Batman um, num powers plus plus and say, okay, I just want to give them an extra power. This C file can't do that because at this point in time, with this and this knowledge, there's no knowledge of the struct. So we don't know the struct and we can't use it. So the only thing we can do is, is ask politely of the function that we can see that we want to do something with it. So that's the kind of protection because the only thing we know about Batman, capital P person for Batman here is they're a pointer to another struct. That's as much information as we have. They're a pointer to another struct. We don't necessarily know what that struct is, so we just have to live with this and say, that's all we know. Yes, we know it's a memory address, but we don't know how big that memory is. We don't know what it's made up of. So we can't just go trying to access things inside it. So this is the protection. The fact that this line can't work is the protection from us editing this struct incorrectly. And so we see that in the function that has the capability of editing the struct, it checks whether things are working correctly. So it says, is this working correctly? If this is working correctly, then you can go ahead and do those things, but you can still only do the right things in there. So that's the, that's the combo of what's going on there. Um, Om was asking about uh, what keyboard I use. I think people have asked about this before. It's a, it's a Corsair keyboard. Just trying to show you the keyboard there. Uh, Corsair R65. K65 or R65? I think it's R65 because it's got the RGB on it. You can see my, my gaming keys lighting up here. Um, uh, MX Cherry Red switches, I think. People really get into keyboards. Hey, this is not the first time people have asked me about my keyboard. Um, <laughs> asking me about my keyboard and my wallpaper and stuff. <laughs> um, I can't remember what my wallpaper is. Oh, this is Warhammer 40,000. So I think people people kind of know that I do a lot of painting miniatures and stuff like that. So this is like the the cover of one of the books from the, the like the 1980s of Warhammer 40,000. So it's just funny little things like that. Okay, so other questions. Um, Brendan was asking about, not necessarily related to the lecture, but that's fine. You can ask questions about other things. Um, how does argv as an array work? Okay, okay. Let's, um, I'm just going to close this stuff. What lecture would that have been? Nine? Wait, oh nine. Was it nine? Oh, no, 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 I, I needed to go back one further. Character demo? 
Was there one after that? Oh, here's the arguments. Yeah, there we go. Um, which is a good one? I think the arg convert. Actually, both of them are going to have. Oh, actually, let's just open the rhymer. Because the rhymer had more code in it in case there's anything else I want to talk about. Okay, asking you about argv as an array. So let's just see what else you were saying. Um, can you treat it like a 2D array? Like we're going argv something something. Yes, you can do that. So if you want, say, the first letter of the second word. So the way I like to treat argv is it is an array and it's an array that contains character pointers. I like to think of it like that, because basically if I think of it like that, I can say that each character pointer is the first letter of a string, which means it can be used in place of strings anywhere we want to. And there's an array of access to strings in a sense. So the way I'm gonna think about it when I'm thinking about it conceptually is I'm just gonna think about it as an array of strings. And if you think about it as a 2D array of strings, you can do everything and it will most likely work. Uh, I don't think there's any particular cases where it won't unless you start trying to loop through it assuming the length of the strings because you can't assume the length of the strings you don't know that you have to actually go through and um, work with the um, work with the null terminator for when each of these strings is going to finish um, so if we look at argv x y does the program look at x to see where the memory address of the first element array of the array containing y is yeah so if we do um argv where were we doing argv oh we were doing this argv argc minus one and that was going to get us to the final word in the array and then check words check words was going to take two words. So what I can do is I can give one of the um, one of the arrays that is stored in argv to this thing as if it's a word, as if it's a string, and this thing will happily, well it's a check word, this thing will happily run it just like it's a string. So it will be able to loop through, um, and I think yeah, it'll loop through until the length of the word if we've done something like strlen for the length of the word, or you could loop through until the null terminator. So in the same way that any array could be considered a pointer to the first element of the array, we can interchange back and forth between something that's looking for an array and something that's actually giving it not necessarily an array, but a pointer to the first element in the array. Um, they're not, they're not entirely the same, there are some subtle differences, but you can treat them as the same, and, and they will work like that. So hopefully that's giving you more information on how that works. Um, yeah, so as you were saying, like you are wondering how an array of pointers can be treated as an array of arrays. So if we had an array that was just an array of pointers, then it wouldn't always work that way because they would just be memory addresses somewhere. But these, sorry, these we know because of how they're constructed that we know that this is coming from strings that were typed in on the command line, that each one of these pointers is, by definition of how this is supposed to work, is going to point us to a series of characters that ends in a null terminator. And the only reason we can use these like that is that we've made that assumption. You can build something like this yourself so long as you make sure that everything that is inside this array is a well-formed string and then you'll be able to use it yeah so brendan as you're saying arrays can be sort of converted into pointers in that if you give the arrays name to a function the only thing the function receives is a memory address um, but the function is then the way we write the function, we're going to assume that the next blocks of memory afterwards are all going to be part of that function, so then we can start accessing it via array indexing rules, and we'll still get the other parts of that array. Yeah, so we're using that kind of interchangeability here to say that 
these pointers to characters are actually giving us the start of each of a wo each each word that was typed in the command line. So they're not always words. Sometimes they're numbers and stuff like that as well, right? Each string, to be more precise, and we have an array of these strings. So we're gonna yeah we're gonna go back and forth on that um, on that kind of idea that anything that is an array is also in a sense the address of the first element in the array. Cool, so that's cleared it up for Brendan, which is good. So Walid had some questions, and I think I was already answering the question from Walid about you can't access the struct inside the main because you can't see the main, so hopefully that's cleared that up. So our main C file is linked with our person C file at compile time. It's actually, yes, this is like you can go deeper into this kind of stuff so let's go back to that code lecture 12 is today's let's go into the multi-file project this is going to open more stuff than i need but that's okay close the backups all right so yes um, let's. I should. I should read more of what Waleed said because I'm a few minutes behind you there. The main file is linked to the person.c file at compile time. Yeah. So when it actually runs, when the program runs, it knows that these names are connected to these names are connected to this piece of code. But when it compiles, it does not know anything about this, and it doesn't know which of these is going to go first. So. When it's compiling this, the only information we can guarantee it has is information from the H file that it has seen because it has explicitly been hash included. And you look at this thing, the only thing it can see is that. It cannot see standard input output, not standard library, anything, because this main function actually doesn't use any of those things. When it does get into this C file, the C file is the one that has access to these things because it's actually doing things like malloc and string copy and stuff like that. So whereas the main, even though somewhere in the depths of this is using, like display is obviously using um, uh, standard input output library, this main doesn't know that it is. It's just trusting that somewhere else that work is being done. Ooh, I should get rid of this line. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I think we'll lead. Oh, yeah. So most of what you're saying there was you were talking to Brendan about that kind of thing as well. Yeah. So hopefully, like the the text explanation along with my explanation is helping out there. Um, the question. You were talking to Matthew about something, but I don't see anything from Matthew. Oh no, you tagged the wrong person. Maybe it was Jaden Matthews that was saying that. Um, yes. So what, what Jaden was saying there makes sense to me as well. So if you pick one of the words out of the string and then you go to the second dimension of that array in a sense, that 2D array of strings, then you can pick out a single letter from it. Yeah. So I think that, I think that conversation is from, from previously. I think you've all had that conversation already while I was talking about the strings. Um, and then we'll lead saying, okay, so when we compile G DCC or GCC is going to go through the files. Um, and then they're going to, um, basically they're going to read all of the instructions in each one of these things. And then the compilation thing is going to have a symbol that says main does this. And it's going to have another symbol somewhere that says give power does this. Display person does this. And they're all just like plonked in the code somewhere. They don't have a specific order. The only way we know how we're going to get access to them is this thing says, I use that same symbol and I know that I'm allowed to use that symbol because I got it from this file. This one also says, yeah, I also got those things from that same file. And this is me giving you those things that link up with this same file. So the linking is gonna be through the H file. And if they're both 
getting the same function definitions from the h file, so this one's getting it from the h file, this one's getting it from the h file, then that provides the chain through from this thing to say, please let me use this function and this thing. So my, my program as it runs would basically search through um, the um, all of the functions that have been compiled and say, yeah, I recognize that symbol because both of us got that symbol from the same place. Oh, which one was I using? Give power. We both got it from the same place. Um, it has the same inputs and outputs. So when you ask for it, I have it available here. And this is only available after the compilation has finished. So while the compilation is going, this thing says, yeah, I can compile this code and I can attach it to this symbol, but I don't know where or when it's going to be used. I'm just making it available. This thing says, I would like to use this thing and I know the symbol I'm going to call on, uh, which is this symbol from the H file, but I don't know what it's going to do. I just know that I have to give it the right inputs and use its outputs. Um, and then when it runs, then, this actually happens yeah so hopefully that's that's giving you some more information about like this is like a little bit of a background into like how compilation and hash includes and stuff work in c because it's actually different in other languages so that's the, the always the scary thing but like eventually you will learn more programming languages and you'll see the difference um because there are other like even just like one of the languages that follows on from c called c sharp um does the same thing but it doesn't require uh, these declarations like it just goes like we're going to compile everything and then we're going to go back again and look for all the things that you said and see if they were compiled somewhere else so there's other ways of doing it so it's nearly like it does two compile passes where the one compile passes it looks for all of the symbols and then the second compile pass it links them all to each other so it just depends on how compilers are built i also don't know if that's exactly what c sharp is doing by the way <laughs> i could just be making that up um but the idea of what it's doing is that okay so we'll lead that's cleared it up for you which is handy that's good um so make sure is asking why do we add new nodes to the left of the first node instead of adding to the right is that something we decide as the programmer or convention that's a very good question um let me open this back up and and look at this the only reason <laughs> we're adding to the left of the nodes that exist is because that's the simplest way to do it if you look at it, it would probably be better to add them to the end of the list. So in order to add things to the end of the list, what I would want to do is find the end of the list. So what I would have to do for that add to the list. So this add to the list is just a one liner where I just add a new thing and attach it to the head. Instead, what I would have to do is I would loop through the list, find the final element of the list, and then change its next pointer to something that I'd done create player on. So I could I could definitely write another function called um, add player create oh no yeah like add player to end of list or something like that and what it would do is it would loop through find the final element not null but the one just before null so the whichever element has its next as null and then say um, change that null to the result of a create player. Um, a call to the create player function. So I could definitely do that. Um, the only downside is I wouldn't have finished this lecture on time if I'd done that ad, or I wouldn't have gotten up to print players, and so we would never have seen anything on screen. So I will eventually um, look at other ways of adding, but I just went just today for the super simplest way, even though it's a bit counterintuitive because it's reversing the order. Um, but we will look at other ways of adding to lists because we have to be able to add in the middle of the list somewhere and we have to add at certain points that we found in the list we have to be able to add at either end of the list so at the moment we've only learned how to add at the start of the list um, but we will definitely be looking at adding at other ends and stuff yeah so it's not this one isn't particularly a convention or anything like that this was a a decision based on simplicity of how much code i had to write to show you things uh, Jaden is saying in this line from the Bender demo, create Bender, name and element and power. Why are the pointers used for the name and element? So I was just like, that was me specifically putting that in just to show off the fact that they could be going, they could work either way. Yeah. 
Uh, no worries for Miksha. Um, yeah, so, so Jaden, in, in answer to your thing, that was just me showing off that the function will be just as happy taking in a pointer that points at a piece of memory that eventually, if you walk through it, eventually hits a null terminator. It's just as happy receiving that as it is receiving something like this, where it's specifically an array. Um, because when it goes into the function, whether you put an array into the function or a pointer to the first character in the array, the function's going to see the same thing. The only thing it's going to receive in this is a memory address, and it's going to treat the memory address as if it's going to be a sequence of characters. So you could nearly, I mean, your compiler will probably tell you you're doing something wrong, but you could nearly give an integer pointer to this function. And I think, depending on your compiler, it will still compile. <laughs> but it will still treat it like a character pointer once it arrives, um, but it will still try to compile it. Because it's like, ah, uh, yes, you call this one an integer pointer, I wanted a character pointer, except they're exactly the same type of value. There's still a 64-bit integer. I'll work with it. It depends. I haven't actually tried that recently. DCC, hopefully DCC will say, don't do this. Um, other compilers like GCC or Clang might, might give you a warning, but still let you do it. So some things are more dangerous than other things. Um, DCC is made so that dangerous things are harder to do. Yeah. So hopefully that answers your question where it's like, you're asking why, and the answer is because no specific reason it's nearly that i made it less readable but i was just trying to show that there were actually like you know there are heaps of functions you're going to see in the standard library that take a character pointer as input and not a character array um and all of those are actually working with strings so like all of these like string copy and stuff let's let's do this so string copy takes this character pointer destination const character pointer source i haven't really talked about const const is a, is something that you i think we'll learn about later rather than 1511 there's enough there's enough stuff to learn about in 1511 but this is basically um saying that this one is a constant which means this one is the one that won't be affected by this this is the one that will be affected so it's like i'm going to read this one but not write to it this one i'm going to write to so that's a don't worry about that though that's something that we'll learn about later um so both of these are character pointers but they're definitely about strings because this is about copying one string from one to the other so they're definitely about strings um, but they don't use the square brackets notation. Whenever every, ev most everything in the um, standard libraries, when they're talking about strings, they will use the character pointer instead of the string. So I kind of threw it in there to be like, look, just remember this, um, because I want you to be able to look at pages like this and still understand that they're strings. <laughs> I'm going back to this. <laughs> oh, just to freak everyone out again. Um, Okay, I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, hopefully everyone's got some useful information out of all that stuff at the end as well. Uh, and I will see you all next week. Hope everyone has something that they're doing for the long weekend. Hopefully it's at least something restful or something like that. And we'll see you all on Wednesday. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>